Thank you very much. It's just beyond belief how exciting uh, the whole Thompson, Univers Thompson Workers University is. Uh, I, want to, I want to ask you to help me. If I say something that is unclear, just stop me and I'll try to repeat it and make it clear. It's much better to have an interruption than to have me go on and have something that I lose you with. You had the quotation about theology uh, to begin with, Marx associating theology with primitive accumulation. And I'm going to start with the same theology. So here you, you would understand that Adam Smith is relevant to primitive accumulation. And like an astrophysicist trying to understand the Big Bang, he asserted that the accumulation of stock must, in the nature of things, be previous to the division of labor. He was correct. But he was raising important questions, but even more, he was creating confusion about the process of primitive accumulation. Smith's speculation about the economic bing bang of primitive accumulation evoked no further comment until 1821, when Robert Torrens picked up the story. Torrens attributed original accumulation to individual initiative rather than disposition. And Torrens' quote reads, in the first stone which the savage flings at the wild animal, he pursues in the first stick that he seizes to strike down the fruit which hangs above his re reach, we see the appropriation of one article for the purpose of aiding in the acquisition of another. And he goes on. So Marx responds to, to uh, Torrance quite humorously. He says, no doubt this first stick, which of course is Stock in German, would explain why Stock is synonymous with capital knowing full well that the low-hanging fruit of early capitalism was a violent seizure of other people's means of production. So in capital, Marx took Smith's word of original accumulation, translated, translates into Ursprunglich, which then can mean either original or primitive. Then the English translation of capital primitive accumulation first appears, and the rest is history. Of course, throughout history, people have taken land from others. The forcible removal of people's means of production for the purpose of commercial gain only came later, after the growing urban population of Northwest Europe increased the demand for wool. At the time, the agricultural surplus was very small. In 1520, a hundred families on the land could only grow enough to support 106 families, hardly a surplus at all. By throwing people off the land, a relatively few remaining people could take care of a large flock of sheep because the cost of their upkeep was relatively small. Huge profits could occur. Now, the first protest against this primitive accumulation uh, came from Sir Thomas More's Utopia, where he talks about sheep now devour men. But it wasn't sheep devouring men. It was our early proto-capitalists. In contrast, Smith was intent on def defending capitalism lest it be hard with any disreputable behavior. He set out to make the case that primitive accumulation had nothing at all to do with capitalism. The core of his ideological project was to present capitalism as a natural system of voluntary market relations 
devoid of conflict, and beneficial to all mankind. Conflict is removed from all of Smith's vision of the world. Whereas in Marx's primitive accumulation, the conflict-free development of capitalism does not exist. In fact, Marx answered Smith's division of labor with his own social division of labor, the distribution of work labor among separate workplaces. But this first social div division of labor meant a forcible redistribution of labor. Smith's world is no longer possible. Now this kind of social division of labor is very interesting because it, it brings up the question of how industry split up and specialize in a way that creates presumptive market efficiency. And when we look at this, when we look at even what industrial economics says about this, it casts doubt on the perspective of economics in which business somehow achieves a timeless equilibrium. From Marx's perspective, primitive accumulation is an essential part of the evolution of the social division of labor, as was the case in primitive accumulation. So Smith gives us the invisible hand, and he tells his readers that the modern version of primitive accumulation taking place in Europe today would never exist. He correctly understood when he talked about North America that England's self-interest would be to avoid formal empire in North America, realizing that an informal arrangement would provide all the benefits of empire with a mutual, I mean, with a minimum of expense. Now, now this happens to be very relevant to what's going on today. That is, from the very beginning, the American approach to empire after they got beat down in the Philippines, was to avoid direct control of other countries. It was cheaper and more efficient to do it indirectly. And you here in Slovenia understand full well how this indirect control works and how it is likely to become much more important within your own country. So let's see where we go next. When we look at Adam Smith, his Wealth of Nations was not a particularly popular book. This is important in getting a, a feel for Adam Smith and what happens with his book. When Malthus signed out his copy of the book from his college library in 1789, that's 13 years after it's published. He was the third person to have done so at Cambridge. The modest interest in the book is surprising given that Smith was already very, very famous for having written the theory of moral sentiments. But suddenly, with the French Revolution in 1789, fear swept throughout the world of British property owners and the panic stimulated interest in Smith's ideological defense of the status quo. After all, Smith showed how the economy worked as a system of liberty and justice, again devoid of conflict. However, Smith, while well, he said that, contradicts almost everything he says afterwards. Jacob Wiener, a very famous and conservative University of Chicago professor uh, wrote traces of every conceivable doctrine. Um, one second, I lost my place. Uh, traces of every conceivable sort of doctrine are to be found in the most Catholic book. And an economist must have peculiar theories indeed who cannot quote from the wealth of nations to support his particular purpose. And indeed, I will tonight quote from Smith to support our particular purpose. The next interesting response to Adam Smith came when Francis Horner, a famous member of the Bullion Committee and editor of the, Bullion, uh, editor of the Edinburgh Review, 
rejected a request to prepare a set of notes on the book. Why? It's a very interesting response. He said, I should be very reluctant to expose Smith's errors before his work had operated its full effect. We owe much at present, at present to the superstitious worship of Smith's name. That still continues in our country, the United States. Until we can give a correct and precise theory of the origin of wealth, his popular and plausible and loose hypothesis is as good for the vulgar as any others. In effect, Smith solved the mystery of primitive accumulation. It all came from cooperation and mutual consent. Horner's fears were mistaken. Today, people read Smith superficially as nothing more than a defense of laissez-faire. And as a result, there are new editions of Wealth of Nations. There, I'm sorry, there are more new editions of the Wealth of Nations published in the 1990s than in the 1890s, and more in the 1890s than the 1790s. That is, Smith is this accumulation of ideological power. Then how, let's look at Smith's ideology a little bit more carefully. And, you can, and it will show you sort of the point of con uh, contact between primitive accumulation, in a way, and modern industry. So Smith gives us this rustic workshop in which workers can increase their productivity because of the primitive labor, primitive, uh, I mean, because of the division of labor in the pin factory, presumably organized by some kindly entrepreneur. And generations have been delighted by this type of Smithian picture. And as a professor of rhetoric and an author of an influential book on rhetoric, Smith had a clear grasp of what was required in order to convince others. In other words, Smith understood ideology, and he also understood public relations. So his treatment of the pen factory is a masterpiece of rhetoric. First of all, he neglected to tell his readers to build up his own reputation that he was going to use statistics plagiarized from an article, plagiarized from two articles about French pen factories. Then he gives his pin factory presentation first in the course of lectures to his students in 1762 and 1763, more than a decade before the wealth of nations. And the pin factory came in the midst of a lecture on class warfare. Smith fell into this discussion accidentally. In a lecture, he was explaining the importance of law and government. And he says, they maintain the rich in the possession of their wealth against the violence and rapacity of the poor. And by that means, preserve the useful inequality in the fortunes of mankind. Let me ask you, if I just talk, I'll forget a lot of this. And there's some interesting stuff, but I think it'll be, do better if I just talk. So. Let's carry on that way. Let's talk about the pin factory. Now Smith tells us, and I, I won't be able to remember the statistics and the like, so you'll have to bear with me on the numbers, but when he talks about this pin factory uh, with, with the students, he's not talking about the pin factory, he's talking about the law. He's talking about the law used to protect property. And then he says, because of this, Everybody's doing much, much better than before. The lowest worker, he says, has more wealth and income than the richest Indian prince. I assume he's thinking about Native Americans in the United States and not India. And then he loses track. Smith always loses track of what he's saying. I do too. Uh, but he loses track, and he says, except for the farm worker. And he starts talking about the oppression of the farm worker. And he says, they, weigh, they hold the wealth, the, the weight of the earth on their back. 
And it's so heavy that they're driven into the ground. So he compares them to the Greek god Antaeus, who carries the earth on his back. But this is so heavy, they're driven into the ground, and the lecture finishes. Well, he's not going to leave it like that. He comes back. And he says, to what do we owe the great wealth and prosperity of the ordinary people? Why, it's to the division of labor. Yes, he tells us about the pin factory. And there he explains what his statistics mean in the pin factory. He's much more honest. The professor of rhetoric isn't honest when he publishes it in his book. And he said, if an individual pin waker is going to make pins, he may make maybe three pins a day. He says, but in the pin factory, they make a thousand pins a day. I don't remember the exact numbers. Well, that's very amazing. Now, when he's talking to his students, he's much more explicit. He said, if an individual worker has to dig the ore, refine the ore into metal, shape the metal into rods, then he could only produce an average of three pins. Well, that's like saying, if you go to the museum in your town and you see a worker hanging up a masterpiece, are you going to credit that worker with the great painting? When you go to the store and you check out groceries, do you give the checkout worker credit for growing all the food? The work was already done. All the pin workers had to do was to cut the piece of wire, put an edge on it, and then hit the top, which is going to make it flat. Of course, the division of labor, the way Smith presents it, is going to make a miraculous change. Now, here he is plagiarizing these French articles. What he doesn't tell us is that the French articles said that working in a pin factory was very dangerous. It wasn't just some rustic little workshop. The constant cutting and hammering and shaping this metal was creating metal flakes that were giving terrible respiratory diseases to the workers. And then Smith goes on and he gives us another little story. He says, the children in the same passages, the children who make nails are also very agile. And then the question is, who are the children who make nails? And here we get to a really interesting story about the pin factory. The biggest industrial plant in the world was in Adam Smith's village of Kirkcaldy. It was called the Karen Works. And the Karen Works was a factory to make possible the cannons that made possible for England to bring the wonders of primitive accumulation throughout the world. <clears throat> the Karen Works owner was a close friend of Adam Smith. But he never mentions the Karen Works, and in fact, he never even mentions coal except as a consumer good for heating up a house or for cooking. That is, he gives no hint of an industrial world. Why not? Because a worker in the Karen Works has no chance at all to become the master of his own Karen Works. That the worker in the big Karen Works is going to be a worker for the rest of his life with very little chance of advancement. So he doesn't tell us this. He doesn't mention the carrying works. He doesn't mention anything about heavy industry. He tells us about the boys making nails. Well, who are these boys? Where does this work come from? Who are these nail workers? Well, the carrying workers paid nail makers from around the country a big amount of money to relocate to Kirkcaldy. Smith's village. Remember, this is a small village. He had, he had to walk a mile or so to get to Kirkcaldy, I mean, to get to the Karen Works, but it's true he had to wait for a boat to go across the small river. But it's within walking distance, close walking distance. You never hear anything about them. 
because Smith was a professor of rhetoric. Okay, what about the mail workers? Where did they get their workers? Well, part of the deal in relocating was the head of the Karen Works agreed to make deals with the local orphanages to give them their dexterous little children that Smith writes about. So he doesn't write about any, any type of authority and control. And so he dismisses primitive accumulation and he dismisses the game laws that are used to protect primitive accumulation. These were laws in which in England it was a capital offense. It was a capital offense to hunt for deer. It was a capital offense to put black soot on your face so that you would be less seen by the deer in moonlight. It was a capital offense. If I come to your house and say, let me in, and the police are looking for me because I'm involved in hunting, then you would also be at risk for capital punishment. Now, this is important because the game laws were used to keep people from fending for themselves. So even if they were displaced from the land and had to go to the factories, hunting would still give them a way out of factory work. So it becomes very, very important. None of the economists, none of the major economists of time ever, ever, ever spoke about the game laws, except Adam Smith, and he blamed it on the aristocracy. He says that was, that was foolish aristocrats. Okay. So this is this is this is the background of the pain factor. It is a bunch of malarkey, and hopefully we have gone some distance today in terms of poking a pinhole in the balloon of the pain factory. Now it turns out, and I would have forgotten this if I hadn't looked at the computer, it turns out that there was a factory, a pin factory, that was founded in 1692, almost a century before Adam Smith, and it used steam power. What? It was a famous pin factory. It used steam power. Actually, it used water power, but when the water was low, they used a steam engine to lift the water to run the pin machines, pin making machines. Now there was a man named Arthur Young. Arthur Young was, well, somebody did a PhD dissertation and he looked at who was quoted in Parliament. And Adam Smith was one of the rarely quoted people in Parliament. Arthur Young was quoted all the time. And he wrote a book called A Six Months Tour Through the Southern Counties of England and Wales. And he writes about this pin factory, the Docker factory, and talks about how everybody should read it. Now, Young's book was, unlike Smith's Wealth of Nations at the time, it was a bestseller. And people from other countries would come to England and enjoy industrial tours. Benjamin Franklin, for instance, writes about his industrial tourism. That's people would come to England and visit the very important factories because it was so interesting. But it wasn't interesting to Adam Smith. So his paint factory didn't have coal, didn't have steam, didn't have industrialization. And this was really modern. The machines would produce three by four strips of metal. Then other machines would cut these plates into 17 strips. Then a different machine would make it into wire. And then girls would off operate these little machines using water power to run the machine. Why isn't that in Wealth of Nations? Okay. So, that Smith that's primitive accumulation. Now, it turns out there's a whole lot of stuff going on in this little village of Kirkcaldy. We've got Adam Smith writing The Wealth of Nations. We have the Karen Works, 
the first big industrial factory, and we have Sir James Stewart. How many of you know about Sir James Stewart? Well, that's a shame. He's very, very interesting. Sir James Stewart grew up in Kirkcaldy, went to the same village school as Adam Smith, and Adam Smith was jealous of hell of Sir James Stewart, who wrote the first comprehensive book on political economy. Not the wealth of nations, but Sir James Stewart. Now, Sir James Stewart was not a professor of anatomy. He, his father, and his grandfather all got involved in conspiracies. And he was involved in the conspiracy leading up to the famous Battle of Culloden, in which England was able to get German mercenaries, that is, by this time you had King George from Germany being the king of England, uh, he gets mercenaries with cannons, perhaps even made by the Karen works, to destroy the Spot Scottish rebels, who up until that time had been beating the English. So Sir James Stewart is part of it. Uh, he's charged by the government. He never showed up for battle. Maybe he didn't want to get hurt. He said his wife was sick. He escapes to France, and he is the representative of the pretender to the throne of, of England, Bonnie Prince Charlie. He's the representative of England, of, of Scotland rather, to the French court. So he's going to be, if he goes back to England, he's sentenced to death, he's going to be in trouble. Uh, so he travels around Europe, especially around Germany. And I never checked, I'm, I'm sure that he would have been to your part of Europe. But it's mostly in Germany and France. And he has these remarkable analysis, very, very, very deep analysis of how the political economy is arranged. And in fact, his theory of price theory, his price theory, in which he talks about the counteracting effects of supply and demand and the way they talk about pincers. One Hegel scholar claims that he thinks that Hegel got a lot of his dialectic from this guy, Sir James Stewart. Why don't economists know about Sir James Stewart? Why do they know about Adam Smith? First of all, Stuart isn't a professor of rhetoric. And in fact, he starts out his book and he said, I know this isn't going to be fun reading. He's not a good writer, he knows it. And then after he writes his book, he said he regrets having written his book instead of a biography of his poor departed dog, he said, which would have been three times as long, it was much longer than the Wealth of Nations, it would have been three times as long and much, much more read. So it wasn't read. Now why isn't he read? And here I'm going to go back to the computer to read some quotes because I don't want to forget them. This man, everybody understood that he was a very, very deep thinker. So much so that the East India Cave Company gave him a big diamond ring to give him advice about Indian currency. After he publishes The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith goes back and said, in effect, I would like a contract with you. He says, after all, I have answered all of Sir James Stewart's mistakes in my book without ever once mentioning his name. A very catty, snide thing to say. Uh, so he's answered all his mistakes without saying what the mistakes are, but you read his book and you can find out the right way to think. So Stuart is, but he does something else. Stuart has a defect that is rarely found among professional economists. If you want to be a successful economist, honesty is a terrible, terrible characteristic. And Sir James Stuart had the misfortune to be honest. How honest was Sir James Stewart? Um, 
First of all, he was a great admirer of Sparta. That actually wasn't unusual at the time. But he said that slavery is a violent method for making man laborious in raising food. But, he said, because he doesn't, he's not defending slavery. He said, but a market properly arranged could accomplish the same objectives that Spartan slavery promised. He says, in the past, here's the quote, men were forced to labor because they were slaves to others. Men are now forced to labor because they're slaves to their own wants. What wants did he mean? Those who became, become servants for the sake of food will soon become slaves. That is, capitalism is enslaving people. Now, the book is reviewed, and it gets lengthy reviews. And the typical review says something like this. Sir James Stewart is a very, very smart man, and his work is very, very intelligent. But nobody should pay close attention to somebody who compares the market to slavery. Dump this book. And he wasn't read. He was read in Germany. He was read by Hegel. He was read by Marx. But English academics paid virtually no, no, attention to Stuart. So Stuart's up in Scotland. He got permission to return. Uh, he's up in Scotland. He's writing, he's bringing his book out. And he can see what's going on. And here I'm going to return, refer to something a little, a little bit later about Methodist missionaries in Scotland, where, St where Stuart's writing. And his family did have a coal mine. This is from a biography of Wesley, John Wesley, who had the Methodist missionaries going off to North America to convert the heathens, namely the Native Americans. What seems to have brought, this is a quotation, some of the early Methodist missionary workers to the coal miners What's the suggestion that there was no need for them to go as far afield as America in their efforts to convert the barbarous heathen? The colliery districts could, present, could provide them with plenty of savages to civilize and to Christianize. That is, primitive accumulation is having a big effect. Anybody who's looking can see it. But here is a, here is a snippet for one of the reviews. In plain English, that by one way or another, men are made slaves by statesmen, because Stuart is saying a wise statesman can help to make this transition to capitalism. I'm sorry, I moved away from the microphone. Stuart is saying that a statesman can help make possible this transition to capitalism. Um, in order that they may, in order that the useful may feed the useless, that is indeed the present state of what is called liberty in America, yeah, of liberty in England. But in fact, they are not made slaves to their passions and desires, for that is common to all men. It is the hard task of, it is the hard hand of necessity at present, like that of the taskmasters in primitive times that compels them to work. The hired husbandman has indeed one passion that engages him to become a slave and to labor. It is the goading dread of starving that enslaves him and urges him to toil without desire. So in effect, the reviewer is saying, Stewart is correct, but it's just because people need food and everybody needs food and there's nothing wrong with it. Don't read Stewart. Now, Stuart, here we get very, very interesting. He says, the Spartan form may be compared to the wedge, those of the modern states, to watches, which are continually gone wrong. That is, 
the economy messes up and you need something to sort of rejigger Maybe like Angela Merkel. So he's looking to statesmen to guide his system. He doesn't think it can be done just by markets. So what he sees is that you need intelligent management in order that you can make the transition to capitalism. So he says what, what may be disastrous when abruptly introduced may well be beneficial if it could be accomplished more slowly. And here's a quote. Sudden revolutions are constantly hurtful and a good statesman ought to lay down his plan for arriving at perfection by gradual steps. And here he says, but caution is important. He says a young horse is to be caressed when a saddle is put on his back. That is, these workers had to be not just treated by force, but you required some sort of ideological support in order to make that transition seem reasonable. So while Adam Smith gave comfort to later economists, Stuart repelled them. In short, he was honest. There's an interesting incident which examples, uh, which gives an example of Smith and liberty. In 1757, a few months after the Militia Act was ordered, the workers had to spend their Sundays training in a militia. On one Sunday, some of the workers knocked on the door of a clergyman and said, since we're out there protecting you, we would like a barrel of ale. And the workers were not willing to stop asking for some beer. Smith writes a letter. Now, remember, Smith is, Smith is telling people that they should be calculating like merchants. Like any good merchant, the militia people said, we're only getting six pence for six pennies for spending our weekend. Give me some beer. Okay, here's here's this friend of freedom and, and liberty and a voluntary economy. The Lincolnshire mile mobs, okay, these are mobs, it's about a dozen soldiers. The Lincolnshire mobs provoke our severest indignation for opposing the militia. And we hope to hear that the ringleaders are all to be hanged. So much for laissez-faire. You might guess that I'm not a big fan of Adam Smith. Now, we come next to David Ricardo. Ricardo is very, very interesting. Ricardo is much more of a pro-market person than Adam Smith has ever dreamt of being. And Ricardo, when he talks about prudent accumulation, he's concerned about Ireland. After all, he is a parliamentary representative for Ireland. Well, then he's never been to Ireland, but that's not important. He bought the seat, fair and square. So Ricardo's looking at Ireland, and he's talking about how in England you should have large farms. But in Ireland, he doesn't want small farms. What's the difference? Because he didn't think that the English workers would be able to take care of themselves well enough, feed themselves well enough, in order to avoid factory labor. But in Ireland, in Ireland, workers on a small plot of land by using the potato could feed themselves without going to work. So he says, in Ireland, we need large farms to make sure that people go to work. People get interested in the market. Now, when we go back and we look at Marx, his primitive accumulation argument gets interesting from another 
direction. That is, you have um, what Marx calls relative surplus value. That is, it takes less labor time to produce workers' sustenance, which can make the factory or whatever the business is more profitable. So although they're throwing people off the land, there's a movement to force people to become more self-sufficient by growing their own food on small plots. And you had people who were doing careful calculation to make sure that people would be gardeners, which would lower the cost of wages, and not farmers, which would prevent people from accepting wage labor. So this primitive accumulation is part of a calculation throughout throughout classical political economy, but nobody really, really talks about it. Uh, and in fact, Ricardo writes in this need to drive people off the land in Ireland, he says, the evil of which the Irish ought to complain is the small value of food of the people compared with the value of other objects of their consumption and the small desire they have of possessing other objects. Cheap food is not an evil, but a good. And then this is in italics. If it is not accompanied by an insensibility to the comforts and decencies of life. That is, you have to first civilize the people to want more consumption goods so that they won't be able to survive by feeding themselves, they'll go to the factory, and then we'll ask them to do something to feed themselves to increase relative surplus value. Okay. And he, he, goes, he goes with this, uh, on with this. He says, the facility with which the wants of the Irish are supp supplied permits the people to pass a greater part of their time in indolence, oh my god, indolence, free time, that's terrible. If the population were diminished, this evil would increase because wages would rise, and therefore the laborer would be able, in, able to exchange for a still less portion of his labor to attain all his moderate wants require. And then here he says, you know, he talks about the ignorance, indolence, and barbarism of the inhabitants. He's complaining about. And then he says, misery proceeds from the inactivity of the people. To be happy, they only need to be stimulated to exertion. Okay, so here you have a country. England's come, taken over the land, thrown people off the land except for small little strips of land in which they're feeding themselves with their potato, and that's not good enough. They don't want just the land, they want the labor too. Primitive accumulation. And Ricardo goes on, and then this will finish with Ricardo. In some countries of Europe, and many of Asia, as well as in the islands of the South Sea, the people are miserable, either from a vicious government were from habits of indolence, which makes them prefer present ease and inactivity, though without security against want. And then again, he goes and talks about the dangers of depopulation. He compares Ireland, Poland, the South Sea Islands, all of it's very bad. Now, he got criticized for this, and he took it out of the second edition of his book, but this was him. So now let's skip ahead two centuries to the contemporary world. We still have the confiscation of land going on. I mean, the whole continent of Africa is being stripped of land ownership so that an American hedge fund can come pay a few thousand dollars to some political leader. The <clears throat> government will then give title to the land uh, and there are all sorts of 
tax benefits the hedge funds can have. So you have hedge funds farming all over Africa without setting foot in Africa. And then we have the excessive debt burdens. And uh, we have the example of West Bengal, where the so-called communist government uses a colonial law that permits the government to seize land for industrial purposes. And it's perfectly consistent with both classical political accumulation and modern capitalist practices. And we're going on and on about this. Uh, why is this happening? Why is this happening now? And it's happening for a very, very simple reason. Markets don't work. What happens is we've, we had periodic crises in the US over and over and over. And I like to start with the can I just take this and walk around? I'll be more. Then I won't be tempted to look at the computer. Uh, so, what happened? And I like to look at the depression of the 1870s. I think it's crucial for anyone that wants to understand how markets work. In the 18, late 1860s, 1870s, this was the first time that capitalism learned to harness fossil fuel. Yeah, people in the 1600s were heating up water to make beer, and they were making some steam engines that were pretty crude, but now they were really learning to harness fossil fuels. And as they harnessed fossil fuels, something else was coming in, biting them on the behind. It's called increasing returns to scale. These factories are pumping out more and more and more stuff, and the demand's not there. And because the demand's not there, they compete. And as they compete, as you learn in microeconomics, without any protection, prices go down to marginal costs. And in a capital-intensive industry, everyone goes bankrupt. And this was happening in the 1870s. Over and over and again, simple price theory, capitalist, capitalism doesn't work. Along comes a man named J.P. Morgan. We know him today in terms of J.P. Morgan Chase. And J.P. Morgan is the son of a man who's representing English bondholders. And the bondholders were heavily invested in railroads, especially railroads built by the states. And they're buying these bonds, and each time they buy the bonds, the railroads go bankrupt, the states don't pay back the bonds, and Morgan's family is representing these bondholders. In fact, there's an organization today in London, I forget its exact title, but there are bondholders from Mississippi's bonds, and they're still trying to collect money on the bonds, and they're represented by a man whose name you might be familiar with, but he spells it wrong. He spells Karl Marx, with a C. But I find the coincidence very, very funny and interesting. So these bondholders are going bankrupt. Here's J.P. Morgan. He goes to the railroads and he says, you guys, listen, you got to stop competing. And they all sign an agreement. We'll stop competing. We'll form a cartel and prices won't go down. And then one of the railroads says, you know, I think get a little more traffic if I cut prices. The same thing spirals down, you get more bankruptcies. Morgan says, that's enough. And he starts taking over the railroads. Not only does he take over the railroads, he takes over all sorts of industries. Most famously, he takes over Carnegie Steel and creates United States Steel because Carnegie was going to build a railroad to take coal from Tennessee to Pittsburgh. This was so common that the term Morganization became commonly used for consolidation. Morganization. Now, this morganization is going on, and it's very effective. 
The Depression only lasted 20 years. And we got out of it through the war in the Philippines. The war in the Philippines is interesting. It was the first real American adventure in imperialism. And the U.S. got trounced. Sending the United States back to the Adam Smith theory of imperialism, you do it indirectly. And then we forgot the lesson of the Philippines, and we go back to Vietnam, and we keep to Iraq, Afghanistan. It just doesn't work. So we had this big depression. Then what happens? Okay, let me tell you something I, I think about with modern economics, microeconomics. When we think about microeconomics, we hear that competition is good and depressions are bad. And I say that statement doesn't cut it. Why? What's the matter with that statement? Well, a depression is a intensification of competition. That's when, make, that's when you get competition. So Alex Field just wrote a book about the United States, and he said the most rapid increase in productivity that the United States saw was during the Depression, except maybe during this 1870s period. Because you see that right now. You see, in the United States, we would see every week the story, one story in the business page would say, unemployment's going up, productivity is going up. Because when there's pressure, then you have increased productivity. When there's not. So what happened with J.P. Morgan is he took these companies, he eliminated competition, the U.S. economy sort of stagnated, then you had the financial speculation in the 1920s. Now this is part of the story of modern primitive accumulation too. Because as industrial profits are shrinking, you shift to finance and then you get the Great Depression. Now with the Great Depression, boom, 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 productivity's up. So at the end of the Depression, the U.S. could produce as much as before with 16% less capital and many fewer workers. And then we had World War II, and that wiped out all of our competition. And then we had people who couldn't spend their money because business was producing tanks and airplanes instead of cars and trucks. And people couldn't buy refrigerators, they couldn't buy this, they couldn't buy that. So they're saving up money. We got rid of all the debt during the Second World War, except the debt from other countries. And we then had a boom. But because we had a boom, we didn't have competition. And the next thing you know, the Japanese and the Germans are building steel mills and the like, and they're out competing in the U.S. So by 1969, the boom, the, the bloom off this golden age is finished, and capital needs more profits. Well, why does they shift into more finance? But that's when you first start getting this tremendous move toward a right-wing revolution in the country. And I talk about this in a book called The Confiscation of American Prosperity, from right-wing extremism in economic ideology <coughs> to the next Great Depression. Sorry for the cough. And I don't think we've had our next Great Depression yet. We're just in a warm-up. Because what happened was there was no real competition in manufacturing. And even today, we get rid of the competition through moving forward. One time I was in a conference in San Francisco, an Eastern Economic, a Western Economic Association conference, and I heard a familiar voice behind me. And I immediately knew who it was, but I didn't turn around right away so they couldn't see that I was listening in. But it was someone you might have heard of, an American named Milton Friedman. And this was in the, I'm guessing, middle 1970s, maybe 1980. And he was saying, China, 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 they have 100, 200 million underemployed and unemployed people. We'll be able to take all of our unions and break them, sending them over to China and, you know, 
always looking for some escape. In, in, incidentally, in 1791, Hamilton was already talking about the importance of China for U.S. business. And there was a period in the 1860s where, uh, 1870s, where we're having this big depression, and a, a textile owner says, if we could only get the Chinese to have their shirts be one inch low, lower, that would take care of our surplus. So we tried to, try to, now, David Harvey, I, oh, I really wish he would have been here. He says that we don't, uh, we don't address problems, we display them. We just move them somewhere else. So it's like cleaning up your room, uh, I don't want to do the dishes, you move it to another part of the sink, of the counter. And that's what we do with our problems. So J.P. Morgan got rid of the problem of overcompetition, then he created a new problem of lack of competition, and then that meant we couldn't meet international competition. But the business feels that the profits are a natural right. We had this really weak Dodd-Frank bill. And part of the Dodd-Frank bill says that the merchant can't extract a fortune. I mean, I mean that they that the bank can't extract a fortune when you swipe your credit card. It has to be a very small fee because the bank's not doing much. And the small business was demanding that the government take some action. After the, after the uh, law was passed, banks started putting a fee on using an ATM machine, withdrawing your money. And they explained the necessity of this. They said, Dodd-Frank took our profits away. We need to replace them. As if it's their God-given right. And we'll just move over here. And so we're doing this in every single way, trying to get rid of our profit problems. Incidentally, I saw I had the microphone off again. If I do and I trail off, you know, tell me, speak up. Because this is for you, not for me. Uh, so anyway, here we are in Slovenia, and I guess our papers say you're next on the chopping block. I don't know if it's true or not, I hope it's not, it's very nice here, and you've already gone through a big round of privatization, uh, but this is what's happening. The banks feel like it's their right, and the corporations feel that they would rather invest in finance than in production. Now, there was a reason for this. There's a reason for this. Robert Reich, who was considered to be a great liberal, wrote a book in the 90s, and I think it expressed the mindset of American business. And he says, America doesn't have to, the United States doesn't have to be manufacturing steel and manufacturing cars because the future belongs to symbolic analysts, people who can figure things out. And because the United States, we in the United States are very, very smart, and our educational system is the best in the world, even though we've been undercutting it and the results of American education now are abysmal, the idea is we'll be symbolic analysts. And we'll let you, we'll, there's, a, there's a funny quotation from Samuel Johnson who, uh, is he's asked, why is there no industry in your hometown? And he says, I can't remember the hometown, but it makes it funnier. He says, we let the boobies from Manchester do that for us. In effect, they were the symbol, symbolic analysts of the day. So we're letting the boobies from Germany, from China, from Japan, Slovenia, everywhere else, do the work for us. And supposedly, then they'll come and they'll want to hire us for everything. But now, American business is hiring its symbolic analysts through a um, immigration deal, and it can hire much cheaper symbolic analysts from China, not that many from China, lots from India. And as we go down, that means our lust for a continuance of our rate of surplus is going to go up. And the pressure of people on Slovenia, well, 
you have to meet your obligation to make sure that American business is treated justly. And if it means, you know, cut wages half, that's okay. Cut pensions. I mean, it's, it's very much like primitive accumulation. I thought it was just brilliant that Marx was talking about um, public debt as a great lever of primitive accumulation. And you're seeing that. You're seeing that all over, although in many cases it's not even public debt, it's private debt that's bringing everything down. I would rather have a conversation with you than have me continue talking. Would that be okay with you? Okay. Thanks for your patience. this very interesting lecture and now we uh, open the floor for questions and comments. Are there any? You create an institution like this. We haven't been able to do anything like that in the United States. What the hell are you asking me for? <laughs> I mean, you people, I, I mean, look, you've been losing the battle. Uh, it doesn't mean that the war is lost. I mean, Europe's losing some battles. This has happened before. The war is not lost. I mean, you know what's needed. You, you need organization. We're terrible. Our left. We are terrific in organizing circular firing squads. Okay, we haven't. We haven't. We did get the Occupy movement, which was very, very exciting, but we didn't have an ongoing organization, and there isn't much Occupy now. Uh, it, we're not good at it. I'm not good at it. I'm very, very good at it. You'd be reading right now about some big mass movement in the United States and everybody's following Michael Perlman. Nobody follows Michael Perlman because I'm no better at it than anyone else in the United States. Did I avoid your question well enough? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, comments? that you really have a grassroots movement. That is, if you think of it like a package and the political party, it, when you go to the store and you buy something and there's a package with all the pictures on it when you buy it, that's a political party. It's a package inside that counts. So you can call it, you can create a political party, but without a real grassroots movement, the political party is just a statement. It's got to be more than the state. There has to be people. And people willing to back it up. Uh, people willing to do hard work. People willing to cooperate. So what's really missing is that deficit in the thing Marx talks about so much as social relations. So we read Marx, and at least in the United States, our Marxists often are not very good at social relations. 
There's a tendency among the left in our country to create one sect or another, each one thinking they're going to be the party that will lead the revolution. No, it's hard work. And it comes when you, it comes not just from leftists getting together, but what you people are doing, talking to workers, farmers. I mean, I'm, I'm really impressed now. Is this working enough? Okay. Um, part of what I was talking about with this marginal productivity, marginal price thing, <clears throat> there's a passage in Marx in the American translation of the Grundrisse, it's around page 702. And it's just beautiful. And it explains so much of what's going on. Marx says that capital is remarkable in its ability to minimize the value of commodities. It minimizes the value of workers, too. But that's a different story. So, minimize it. Now, think of a restaurant. Think of a restaurant. And I was using this example with Michael Leibowitz a little while ago. Think of a restaurant, and you want to have a successful restaurant. And I'm going to give you some advice on how to make your restaurant profitable. And I would say, when you have salt on the table, if you make the holes that the salt comes out smaller, people will use less salt, and your profits will go. And Marx was saying, capitalism is reaching that point. I mean, we just had a very influential paper written from a professor from Vancouver, Baudry, do you know him? B-O-U-D-R-Y. In which he's saying, long-term unemployment increases are inevitable. There's no way, because we are creating so much labor-saving technology that there's this long-term. So we get to the salt example. So capitalism is really successful in limiting the quantity of labor required. But, 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 Marx says that that's a real opportunity, of course, because now instead of pushing workers faster and faster, you can have them do better. There was a cartoon, I didn't cut it out, maybe 30 years ago in the New Yorker. It was very, very funny. And it showed these people at rows, two rows of desks like this. And walking up the middle of the road is somebody dressed up like a Roman centurion feathers in the hat and the all the armor and light and a whip in his hand going up and down saying to these people on their computers more strokes, more strokes, more strokes and you're not going to get good computer programming if you're pressuring your programmers to more strokes, more strokes so Marsh is saying let the workers take more charge give them more responsibility let them take over more of the work and, at the same time, why can't you cut the work down? If there's not enough work for everybody working 8, 10 hours a day, why not cut the work down? And either way, you would let workers develop their own capacity so that we go on a better, better way of life. And the long-run solution has to be toward a vision that we can express to say, look, here are your interests. Let's create a system that will make your life better. This is how. You won't have to work as long. On the job, people aren't going to be more strokes, more strokes, more strokes with you. And that in the future, there'll be more leisure. And probably a better standard of living because we'll learn how to work better, especially if we learn, learn to work with each other. That would be my idea of a long-term future. It's very difficult to talk about. We can talk about you know, the latest corruption with this congressman or this senator or this president, but we have to go further. We have to have a vision. And from what I've seen in our country, we don't, we haven't been able to really develop a vision since the time of people like Eugene Debs in the late 19th, early 20th century. Debs could talk to the workers. He could get through to the workers. 
and talk like them and with them. We don't have that. But again, I sit back and look at what you've done in your own life. Now you have a question. Yes, the question is for the, my comrade from the future. If I can ask a question, it's a bit more theoretical, so uh, excuse me if I bore you. Uh, because I, I wanted to ask you a question about the notion of modern primitive accumulation. You, you thought there is something like modern pri primitive accumulation, and it's obvious that there is with the public sector privatization and everything. But uh, when we think of that as a notion, we uh, counterpose it to the classical case of capitalist accumulation that is not primitive. Uh, and now, uh, what I wanted to ask you is, when we uh, introduce uh, this term, when we say, okay, there is classical capitalist accumulation today in capitalism, but there is also uh, modern primitive accumulation, uh, do we not need to, to repeat the Marxist kind of argument when in Capital he first starts to give us a dialectical, uh, dialectical view uh, what is needed for uh, uh, production of commodity to exist in the world and then after many pages of this formal dialectical argument he says okay let's see how is this made in real historical moment in England and everything. So, do we not need now, when we say, okay, uh, 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 here is normal capitalist accumulation, but there is also primitive, modern primitive accumulation, do we not need to give an argument why is it needed? Why is it not enough to have uh, classical capitalist accumulation today? Okay. When I shifted from reading the paper to talking without my crutch. Uh, I warned you that I would forget important things. And you reminded me of one important thing that I neglected. And I think it's most important. First of all, uh, there's one big difference between classical political accumulation, modern political accumulation. Classical political, uh, classical primitive accumulation was occurring at an optimistic time when capital could first see terrific profit opportunities. This primitive accumulation may reflect the death knell of capitalism. That is, there, it's a time of pessimism. What are we going to do in order to stay afloat? How are we going to avoid it? So we, we in the United States, in the city of London, <coughs> are trying to avoid it by deflecting a lot of our problems over to places like here. But let's see, and this is the part of the modern that's so important to talk about, and here I was trying to talk a little bit about it. What's important to see is that, first of all, this is coming out of wheat. Second of all, it's not so much the accumulation, like I was talking about land grabs in Africa, throwing people off the land to build a factory in West Bengal. It's really an attack on public goods. And its attack in the United States is centered on Social Security and Medicare. These are earned benefits. The workers have already paid for it. So you're taking, you're not taking private property, but you're taking collective property. And because it's collective, we do not have a structure to protect it. One of the most glaring examples now is a post office. And I'll forget the dates, I'm not good remembering dates of life. <clears throat> but during the Vietnam War, pressure was building to lower the budget. And Lyndon Johnson was looking for all sorts of ways to make the budget look better. One of the ways was to semi privatize the post office. That is to make it work according to business principles. Now, you go back in American history, the post office was considered to be the core of American democracy. It was the post office that allowed people, like, we're not like Slovenia, we have thousands and thousands of miles separating people, and they said it is imperative that we have a press that can cheaply, at the time freely, distribute their newspapers across the country. 
And so it was a very, very important public institution. It's true during the First World War and at other times the post office has been used to censor, but that's, a, that's something that was imposed from the outside. During the Depression, one of the most beautiful sets of public works that occurred was the post office. So our post offices are almost like museums. They're beautifully built, they have wonderful art, and now what happens is under the Bush administration, he said, we're worried about, Congress said, we're worried about your financial stability. What we want to make sure that you're okay is we want you to set aside enough money in 10 years to cover all your medical and pension expenses. So in effect, they're setting aside money to cover the costs of postal workers who have not even been born. To make matters worse, our post offices are located in central cities where real estate is very, very expensive. So they're telling the post office, you can, sh you can shift your operation to a little mall, lay off most of the workers. Now, I forgot another part of the post office story. And that was during the uh, Nixon administration. Postal workers were paid very, very poorly. And it was a major strike. National Guard was called protect ourselves against the postal workers. And that pushed the privatization much further. So now there's a man named Richard Bloom. Uh, he is the wife of Senator Diane Feinstein. He's the head of perhaps the largest real estate company in the world. Uh, May one of the richest men in the country. And he's in charge of in the real estate business. She's in charge of taking the post offices and transferring to the private sector at a cut rate price. An enormous transfer of wealth. And nobody's paying much attention to it except a small group of very active people. Because there's no grassroots organization they go to. Look what those bastards are doing. And there's no one to turn to. That's why people the little that I knew before I came here, so we don't know much about what you're doing. It's so exciting. That is, instead of inviting me to come here, you people should come to the United States and start an international university of Boston. Because Slovenia is a small country, but ideas can get big very quickly. Any other questions? Comments? Well, um, I don't know, I would be going to hear some more comments about uh, austerity measures as a, as a new way of, of, of uh, uh, primitive economic today. And, and, uh, uh, the way of uh, cutting, the, what do you think about the, the importance of, uh, for the capital? Uh, to cut the power of workers in public sector in a way to cut the all powers, uh, the power of all workers. Uh, I don't know that the public sector capital is now. If you mean public sector, public sector capital has two meanings. Do you mean government power? Public sector. Ah, yes. Okay, that's what I want to make clear. Yeah, cutting power. There are a couple of things politically you have to understand. The Republican Party fears unions because unions are the, one, the closest thing we have to a grassroots organization. Even our unions are embarrassingly weak. And worse yet, the unions are a major contributor in the Democratic Party. And at a time when everything everything's being cut, uh, cutting workers, for example, isn't, doesn't raise that much of a fear. But they're going further and they're cutting teachers, policemen. I would cut policemen, but a lot of people are saying, don't cut policemen. 
firemen. Uh, and it's, it's starting now. What Obama did with this recent set of cuts is he's leading the cuts in ways that would be most disruptive, like the airline controller, the airline uh, people to Air traffic controllers. Air traffic controllers, thank you. Flying coming civility. Air traffic controllers, so people are getting angry about that. Obama's back in the But there's no protection for them. Partially because we've had 30 years of boom, boom, boom. One man, one man has already spent one billion dollars on a program to destroy social security. It's a fetish. All sorts of, so what happens is the rich people pull out these profits, often from sweetheart deals, and then use the profits to destroy the rest of society, which will make it possible for them to pull off more profits. The technical name for this is cannibalism. That is, they're cannibalizing the whole economy. How the hell can we expect to compete if we keep if we keep cutting education? I protested. I protested strongly. I was one of the leading voices of protest when Ronald Reagan dared to increase the tuition at the University of California from zero to three hundred dollars. Now you have students who leave college by an average was say $20,000 in debt. And they pass a law that makes it illegal for them to bank, go bankrupt on private debt. What kind of symbolic analysts are going to be able to function with that kind of pressure? You see at the universities the level of mental problems soared as if, if I were a member of Al-Qaeda and I wanted to destroy the United States of America, I wouldn't be doing bombs. I would be making sure that I could re-elect the same people we've been electing. If, and, and if they had, other countries have more patience, and I think You would think that some of the European social democratic countries would have had more backbone. Back we have. Partially you created a suicide pact over here. And partially, uh, frankly, our economic theories have been very effective. Is there much resistance to it here in Slovenia? No. I mean, even in China, when I go there, every department has some American spouting this crap. And it's not even consistent. Just as I told you with the idea of the difference between depression's bad and competition's good. No, the two are together. And you can so it's very hard to get something started. That is, if you, you know, if you're on camping and you have to rub two sticks together, I have tried it a few times, I never did it, I didn't have the patience. It takes a long time. Once you have a fire, you can burn down buildings, forests, all sorts of things. It's not hard. It's getting it started. So thank you, last for your question. That is to show that I'm a very powerful person to make these demands of people. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Why? Any, any other questions, comments? No. Uh, I'd like to get <laughs> some of the women. <laughs> in my house, women, women give the orders. So, look, give me your question. I would like to ask you a question if I may. <laughs> so, yeah, to stop this. Uh, <laughs> you owe me a favor. Uh, so my question would be a similar one to my comrade from the third row. So what is your definition, your 
issue of a primitive accumulation or whether yet, where do you drive, uh, uh, draw a conceptual line between accumulation by economic means and accumulation by political means? For instance, you mentioned accumulation by financial, I mean financial accumulation, not only uh, uh, on the case of uh, public debt, but also on the case of uh, private debt. And you mentioned uh, private debt as primitive, as a form of primitive accumulation. So, to, um, uh, to go back to the beginning, what's your definition of primitive accumulation? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to talk uh, because we're dealing with all sorts of different kinds of property and certain types of distinctions I don't know how to make. I can't distinguish quite between government powers using their powers to take something and private organizations doing it because they do it through legal matters legal measures, and the legal measures are put in place by the government. So, business gets, let me, let me give you an example of what's going on. Uh, states used to have laws against usury, collecting high interest. And uh, it was illegal. One state didn't have such a law. And because of the internal globalization, all the credit card companies registered in North Dakota and they could collect big insurance there. And there was no way that, thank you, there was no way that uh, other states could legislate that would stop North Dakota. And so the banks just transfer ownership there. Is that private? Is that public? I don't know. When uh, when private banks make loans, often states play a very important role in having countries take loans. Not so much here, but in, say, Latin America, that's been the case. Take this loan. Certainly the World Bank and the IMF do that. Take this loan and sell us your soul. So I don't know how to make a, a, a simple, airtight definition of this. But what I do know is there's a concentration of state and corporate power that is lined up in such a way, reinforced by the media, by the educational system, by all sorts of institutional supports that is able to steamroll its way over the public. And the big difference today is the center piece is to reduce the public sector. Now, in some cases, reducing the public sector, like your question, reducing the public sector means cutting the salaries of workers. In other cases, it means give us the whole institution. One of the reasons the privatization of the post office began was American parcel services wanted to be able to take over from the post office. I don't know if the question answer satisfactory. Uh, maybe you made a mistake. Fighting me, but that's good. It's fine, thanks. Uh, I think we yeah. Uh, well, um, I have first a theoretical question. Like, I'm a bit surprised that we didn't listen to the name of Locke when we were talking about like poverty. Since I mean I know he is like a political philosopher, but a person who devoted uh, who devoted like one chapter in his thesis for economics, I'm a bit surprised that we can listen to his name. And second, I would like you to comment on like I'm sure you have, you are familiar with what happened like in Europe like lately like with Greece and like one month ago with what happened in Cyprus like with uh, but the banks were close to like. Uh, shutting down, and then they ask 7.8%. Uh, uh, they were supposed to take 7.8% out of the savings of all the population. Then there were protests, and actually the parliament did for once what it's supposed to do, and they listened to the protests. And uh, they, I mean, the result was like shutting one of the two main banks, and uh, then they actually took only percentage, that percentage, 7.8% uh, out of all the savings over 100,000 
And uh, I mean, in my opinion, this was only possible because of, it. I mean, it's a small island, it's, it's, the, the economy is not that big. But would, it be, would this be possible, like this protest, this unrest of the population, would it be possible in, like, in, in countries and economies with bigger population and stronger economies? Would it be possible? Would it be possible? Can you please repeat the question? <laughs> the thing is, like, I, as I as I told, uh, like in this kind of cases, because like Cyprus has a very small population and a limited economy, so I mean in this I mean because there is like this theme not theory, like this uh, you know there's maybe there would be a wave like uh, the next to follow would be Italy and or I don't know where it would go or Spain. So would 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 what happened in Cyprus be possible in in countries? like Italy or Spain, like the unrest of the people, like... I think it's striking that the austerity hits relatively small countries first. And I think that's strategic. Iceland was an excellent place to start. Uh, they don't have a big army. Uh, soon they're... It's just a very... Iceland will be a medium-sized talent in many countries. I, I'm shocked that Italy, which is very dysfunctional, is able to get away with it as long as they have. So there seems to have, uh, it, there seems to be a logic to it. As you're suggesting, I agree with you. Um, and, this, and also it's important that it's a divide and conquer. That is, if if the IMF had gone to Europe as a whole and said, Germany, you beha you're behaving okay, all the rest of you guys, this is what you have to do. They never would have gotten away with it. But you can attack Iceland. You can attack Ireland. If you can attack something as big as Greece, then you go back to tiny little cycles. It's tragic. And, and, but the tragic is understandable in the sense that there is, there is no real grassroots opposition. You're talking about development of the party. And what the party can do, what the party can do is not so much that they can get votes and do this, it's that they can create a grassroots. How you do it, I don't know. What we do see is that there are waves in which it goes one way, and in waves it goes the other way. When I first came to Chico State in 1971, one of my one of my students complained that I was just talking left wing stuff. So I went to the John Birch Society, which was the largest right wing crazy organization and said, send me a speaker. And the speaker was very generous. He was an ex-army man. He was part of another organization. I knew the organization because they shot him in the house of a friend of mine and hit his girlfriend. Um, I didn't say anything about that. But he was, he was very gracious in the end. He said, I know, I know that you're not a communist because you wouldn't have invited me to speak. But you're just a fellow traveler. And then he started commiserating, telling me how he lost. That is Nixon's equation, price controls, and socialism. We've lost. I know you won. But we're still right. But, but the point is that from the Great Depression up through the 1960s, there was really a certain degree of support for leftish ideas. I mean, the, the anti-war movement was quite powerful. And the reports we have from now is when they were in Washington protesting, Nixon was very scared. He dismissed the public, but he was physically frightened because they had such a mass following. 
in the United States in our recent wars, there was some protest against Iraq, not that much. And virtually nothing against Afghanistan. Because there's no grassroots organization. Someone else? Yeah, we have um, time for one more question or comment. Sorry? Yeah, yeah that's it. That it will be 7 p.m. No, no, no. Then it has to be one of the we are searching for a woman, a woman with a question or a comment. Thank you. Speaker. Look at the speaker. It's a program. Can you imagine here? A speaker, a woman. It's a program. Oh. We've had some other people. It's a program. It's a program. Actually, I wanted to ask you, uh, maybe if you can talk about two things. One would be about uh, the repetition logic. Uh, a repetition as a logic of uh, uh, repetition of the pre primitive accumulation today. What this logic, I mean, this repetition, how, how we can think about? Uh, because uh, um, the, the logic of the repetition in itself, what actually we can learn? I mean, what, and the second point would be, uh, or maybe, um, you have this title from uh, Smith to Angela Merkel. And uh, if you could actually um, uh, say, because you didn't say much, why you actually took An Angela Merkel as this emblematic figure in, in the context. It's clear, but why? Why you actually could, you could use another name? Because she's a woman. So. Because she's a woman. Yeah. Maybe I was wrong to pick my lady. <laughs> Look, uh, she, has been, she is the figure, from what I see, who has been most vocal in promoting austerity around Europe. And I, I get closer to that in what I wrote, and uh, I made a couple changes, I sent that to you and you can distribute it. Now, as far as the future, and the, the cycles, the repetition, let me leave you with something I think which is very important. I see capitalism as being very weak. It's just like a cornered animal becomes most dangerous, capitalism is very weak. There really isn't any place that you can look at, there isn't any particular industry that you can look at that says, here is a way out. And at some point, it will become clear that what Marx talked about capitalists, capitalism's historic mission to create development, it'll be clear that it's not doing it. I don't know how many years of austerity will take. I don't know how many recessions England will take before it finally sees it's not working. But at some point, it's going to crack. It's going to crack because more and more business will be on the ropes. It'll crack because people will finally see that this regime of austerity is destructive, counterproductive. And what that means is, when it cracks, what happens is uncertain. That is, you can see it going way to the right or way to the left. And the outcome will depend on who is best prepared. When I look at the United States, the answer I get isn't very encouraging. That what you see is that if you look at the United States, President Nixon is way to the left of Clinton. And Clinton is way to the left of Obama. And on the Republicans, the only Republican that isn't more conservative than the previous one might be maybe George W. Bush. But from Herbert Hoover on, each one is more and more conservative. Pretty much the same thing's true for the Democratic Party. At some point, people get disgusted. And the question is, which way, which way will they go? And I guess it's all up to us to decide. So thank you. <laughs>